Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today, Adam Rosenzweig of Going and Rosenzweig rejoins the podcast to discuss the events of the year so far in the context of our first episode, episode 140, back in March of this year. In that episode, we covered Eroy, the energetic return on investment, and how that, coupled with the rising levelized cost of energy, put a real challenge on wind and solar. In this episode, we update where those markets have gone in the last eight months, as well as where natural gas and LNG stands in anticipation of a huge rise in liquefaction from the US, what that means for US markets and globally, and also where we stand on nuclear, the one technology that is an advance in the energetic yield from investment. Adam is a managing partner at Goering and Rosenzweig, a fundamental research firm and investors focused solely on natural resources. As always, if you enjoy the show, please do recommend it to your colleagues or give us a five-star review on the platform you're listening on. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Adam, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Happy to be back. So uh, listeners will remember that we had you back on in episode 140, where we were talking about the the energetic problem with the energy transition. And we really discussed Eroy, the, the energetic return on investment, and how fundamentally, through your research, that it's lower, much lower in renewables compared to oil and, and nuclear. And the required drop in standards of living we would we would have to undergo in order to deploy these at scale. That episode certainly generated a lot of interest, um, one of our most popular episodes this year. You know, and there was a certain amount of pushback on kind of the calculations around Iroy, a lot of it's, you know, how back far back into the supply chain you go and so forth. But I'd love to, before we sort of move on to the events of this year and how many of your theses as Goering and Rosenzweig have played out and are playing out, you know, has anything developed in your reasoning on that side? And if anything, has it strengthened and so forth? Well, no, I think that as far as the theory and the calculations behind it, that, that is one of the sort of nice things about looking at Eroy uh, is that things don't really change all too much. And so if you think about a windmill or you think about a solar farm and the amount of materials that go into that, certainly the subsidies can change and certainly companies have quarterly earnings that always need to get updated in models and stuff like that. But when you think about the actual physical process underlying it, that actually doesn't change too much. But what I think has changed is that back when we last spoke, we said, look, you know, in the event that we were to get higher interest rates or higher material costs... We should expect to see some real problems here. And, and I can talk about why that connects in with, with Eroy here in a second. But I think the big development since we last spoke is that that's what we're now starting to see. So as, as you kind of look through just the announcements coming through this year, I, I jotted down a few before this podcast just so I would have them handy here. There's a report today out by an analyst that we really like saying that the cost of the average green hydrogen facility from a CapEx and an OpEx perspective has now doubled. Uh, You have Plug Power and Orsted, both companies down 50% for the year due to major, major overhauls of the power purchase agreement for things like Sunrise Wind, Empire Wind here in the United States, Commonwealth Wind, South Coast Wind, and then of course in the UK, at the beginning of September, there was a you know completely failed wind auction where there was not a single company that bid for any of the offshore wind concessions that we were that were being put forward there. So I think the big thing that's changed is that we had a test of the model, and we said you know the Eroy model led us to the conclusion that we felt most of the cost savings in the last decade or so on, on a lot of these renewables was actually coming from cheaper material costs, cheaper energy costs, and lower capital cost. And that if we got a normalization of those, we'd start to see some some real changes in a hurry. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing now. So I would think that that's been the biggest development probably in, in the topic of Eroy and in the topic of renewables since we last spoke in May. Yeah. And those are two separate things, right? One is essentially that levelized cost of energy track. And the other one is Eroy, which is fundamentally about the how those technologies liberate energy from whatever source they've got. And I guess just before we move on to sort of those material costs and obviously the interest rate rise, we haven't, there's no new technologies that have, that have changed those equations, so to speak. 
No, that's exactly right. And I'm sorry, I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit when we when I talk about some of these things. The, obviously, the, the two are connected. And in fact, it was the it was the disconnect between the two that really fascinated us. And what I mean by that, you know, if you look at an oil well, if you look at a natural gas well, and then the combined cycle gas turbine that, that would turn that natural gas ultimately into electricity, when you look at that whole system, it's very energetically efficient. So in order, if you, if you were to put one, you know, megajoule of energy into a system like that, you'd basically be liberating almost 25 to 35 units of energy, useful energy out the other side. So that's a really, really efficient recycle ratio. It's basically outside of nuclear power. That's the best we've ever been able to achieve as, as humanity. And when you then try to generate the same amount of energy using renewables, either wind, solar, onshore, offshore, and you then, of course, have to think about the additional costs needed to back that up and turn it into baseload power. Now, all of a sudden, to to drive that 220-foot steel turbine shaft to uh, or pylon to, to, to sink the cement foundation, to do all the carbon fiber and the blades and all the copper and the hookups and connections, all of that requires so much energy that instead of your 30 to 1 on an unbuffered basis, your best talking about 10 to 1, and once you buffer it, you're down to 5 to 1. So the amount of usable energy for every unit that gets invested goes down dramatically. And that stood in real sharp opposition to the claims that a lot of people were making that, that looked at the levelized cost of electricity from renewables and said that they're falling and falling and falling. And so that, that's how the two married together. We said, how on earth could it possibly be that you have something that's so inefficient, and yet the costs are falling? at such a fast clip. And what we realized when we tried to actually build a cost model for a lot of these renewable sources and, and go and see how that's trended over time, that's when we came to the realization that, wait a second, you know, the way you can, can reconcile those two fairly disparate claims, A, that it's inefficient, and B, that it's getting cheaper and cheaper, is that it's inefficient in terms of energy and it's inefficient in terms of capital. However, when the cost of energy and the cost of capital plummet, I guess it stands to reason that your levelized costs of, uh, of renewables would plummet as well. And so, so that's the bridge between those two things. Yeah. And just to be clear as well, this, this is not a pushback against the urgency of the challenge that we face around climate change. This is just simply what solutions are deployed and how do we achieve those with with you know effectively but let's so we also had you on on our live podcast event in april uh hosted by brown brothers harriman and that was episode 148 and that was all about interest rates what is going on that is driving up both those material costs as well as the the, the project costs and and the financiers willingness to, to back some of these these projects can you sort of help us understand why that levelized cost of energy the slope not only shallowed, but also has started going back up again. No, and I think you nailed it. I think it's it's materials costs and it's capital costs. And so we, we made a very, very simple model. All we did uh, is we went back over 10 or 15 years and we looked at what the cost structure of the renewable industry was doing over that time. So, you know, we went from you know, kind of actual line items and budgets and, and financial statements and things like that, and eventually calculated a, a levelized cost of electricity, which matched what, what the observed, you know, Bloomberg, NEF, whoever these guys, whatever, pick your source. And in our model, we had a contribution for all the raw material costs. And from there, we actually went further upstream and we said, how much of the raw material costs are driven by energy costs. And then the second was, you know, how much of an impact was capital cost and, and interest rates driving. And then the third was kind of like your plug. And that ended up being, you know, the, the other costs that, that captured everything from manufacturing to SG&A and what have you. And when you did it in those three buckets, what you immediately saw was that about 75% of the reduction in costs over the last decade was coming, in fact, from cheaper materials, and most of that was coming from the fact that the energy to make those materials was in fact declining, and then the rest was coming from capital costs, and only 25% was coming from operational improvements. And that was a really important realization for us because we said a couple of things. We said, first of all, you know, we don't see that any new technology could possibly displace an old one when the EROI, the EROI, is, is, is so much less 
uh, efficient. But but secondly, whereas everyone was kind of racing over themselves to say how fast would renewable costs keep falling and when would it magically th cross the threshold on an ups unsubsidized basis to compete with fossil fuels, we said, actually, I think costs could increase. And that would be equivalent of telling someone in the computer industry that Moore's law was about to reverse itself. You know, nobody thought that that was possible. Uh, and yet that's what's happening now. And so when you look at all these projects and you look at these deferments and cancellations and people not bidding, basically what's happening is that the uh, power purchase agreements and, and the tariffs that they're to receive for the electricity that they sell is no longer adequate for them to cover their costs, both from a financing perspective and from a material cost perspective. So, so basically the full parameters of the project stopped working and they stopped working in a hurry. And so, you know, for projects that had already agreed to a power tariff, uh, they were forced to go back and threaten to either walk away from the project, including whatever costs had been spent or else renegotiate the tariff structure. And for those companies contemplating bidding on a new one, they just decided to stay out and not do it at all until either the power purchase agreement tariffs go up, or I suppose they're hoping that maybe material prices will come back down. Yeah, yeah. And we've tracked on this podcast as well, the other elements of the story, such as the difficulty around policy, the difficulties around in particular, sort of the, uh, the real estate side, you know, and uh, the permitting side, as well as, you know, actually connecting to the grid. So, but between those things, I mean, it, what's really fascinating me this year is the impact of substantially higher interest rates although actually you know in historical terms the 10-year note is now at its average five percent um it's just we've we've been so long on ultra low interest rates is does is that how else is that impacting the renewables world i mean do you see that in terms of some of these more speculative projects being able to get off the ground like hydrogen and so forth i'd love to get your quick take there before we move on to nat gas and your analysis and then really lean into nuclear Sure. So look, I, I think there's two things that are happening with interest rates and a lot of these different technologies. The, the first is that just purely on paper and, and looking at, 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 at how the economics work, renewables tend to be more interest rate sensitive for, to the underlying economics of the project. And the reason for that is quite simple. There, there's a lot of upfront capex relative to long-term opex. And so when you have a, a gas plant or what have you, you're talking about less upfront capex and more of the cost, just on a relative basis, to say nothing of what the total cost is, a greater proportion of that cost is actually paid out over time in terms of fuel costs. And so when interest rates rise, you can think of it one of two ways. You know, when, when interest rates rise in the, in the in a gas facility, your your out your payments, you know, just kind of collapse, right? Because they just can't get discounted back at a lower price. Or conversely, if you have to invest the capital today all up front, you have a higher carrying cost over time. So the more you can defer those costs, the less sensitive your project is to interest rates. And so that's why renewables are so sensitive. And that's just, you know, that's just accounting. That's on paper when you do the discounted cash flow. However, I think we do have something else that's at play right now. And that is the idea that low interest rates tend to lead to... Uh, what I would call, you know, a, a higher value being played, p placed on way far out in time, more abstract, technological, high multiple, high growth style investing. And we certainly saw that in a lot of parts of the tech sector in the last decade or so. But I think it's also true in the energy sector. You know, if you kind of look at a spectrum and you say, okay, you know, you can a couple years ago, right, you, you had hydrogen companies trading at, you know, 50, 100, 200 times future potential earnings and, and, you know, multiples of their DCF that would be difficult to justify. Or you could buy oil companies that were trading at their PDP values, meaning, you know, if they never drilled another well again and oil prices never went up from, from those low levels, you would get a, a, an adequate, you know, 10 plus percent rate of return. That's how far the pendulum swung away from near-term cash flowing real assets and towards long-dated abstract growth. And so I think we're starting to see the air come out of that bubble. And I think we're seeing that across the whole market. And I think we're seeing it also in the resources space. And so that means a lot of these, you know, more venture capital style, you know, long-dated technology plays whether it be really advanced batteries, whether it be even 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 some of the small modular reactor companies that that have 
pursued public listings have been hurt quite badly. And so I think we're seeing both of those things. I think higher interest rates are actually impairing the project economics on a lot of renewable projects, but I think it's also just kind of deflating this, this um, you know, growthier uh, energy transition story as well. You know, you've already highlighted at the start of the show the, you know, we've seen significant falls in, in equity for many of these um, renewable companies or, or energy companies that have lent heavily into renewables. Is that a story that you can see continuing uh, into next year and beyond? I mean, how, how substantial is that when you, in your research? I think there is farther to drop on all these things because I, I think we're now coming into the realization that they're flawed from a from a technical perspective, from a physics perspective, and a thermodynamics and an Eroy perspective. So I think, you know, the first leg down in a lot of these stocks was taking some of the growth multiple out of them. Uh, but but now, you know, I, I think it could go further because I think people are beginning to realize, well, wait a second, if we are in a in a new environment of normalizing interest rates and normalizing materials costs and the EROI is so bad on so many of these technologies, you know, what what role does that really have in the long-term energy mix? And so I think that that's completely a story that's not priced in and, and would be potentially difficult. So, you know, I, I don't I don't trade a lot of the or any of the renewable stocks. We don't own them. Our mandate would allow us to, but we've stayed away because of the poor EROI. So, you know, whether the sell-off is overdone, I'll leave that to somebody else. But I think that there's definitely a fundamental leg, another leg down from here as companies and, and investors begin to realize that a lot of the assumptions that were put into these aren't, aren't going to work. And, I, you know, I think – I don't want to be too dramatic about it, but I think there's almost a similarity with the global financial crisis. And during that period of time, you know, that entire capital allocation was predicated on the faulty assumption that housing prices can only go up. And I think today, the faulty assumption that was made was that renewable costs can only go down. And in both cases, what, what, what it was was just a trend that could reverse and did reverse and took a lot of uh, investors out with it. And, and I worry that that could happen this time as well. Yeah. Another area of research you've been looking at significantly is, is natural gas. And really, which is obviously we're, we're sort of one of the solutions to the energy transition and decarbonization. Well, gas plays this key role in the interim. And then from your our previous episode, obviously, nuclear, in your belief, plays a key role. And we'll come on to that. The, the question that you've been, I guess, analyzing with natural gas is what happens, you know, where does all this natural gas come from that's going to feed all of these liquefaction plants on the Gulf Coast and the demand for LNG globally and the shift in those pathways as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'd love to get your take on sort of where do you see natural gas going in, in, the, in the short and medium term and, and, and how indeed are we going to meet those supplies? Is that even a question people are asking given the expectations that shale will go on forever? No, it's really not a question that people are asking. And, and frankly, I think they really ought to be. You know, last year when Russia invaded the Ukraine, uh, the whole world, particularly Europe, but but really the whole world woke up to to what they're going to do next and, and how on earth Europe is going to look to displace 17 BCF a day of Russian gas. And the whole market really tightened up, to say the least. And so European gas prices, you know, exploded to the upside. I think they eventually hit $100 in MCF equivalent in prices into Asia as well. What Europe did last year was pretty shocking. You know, they shut at its peak, about 15% of the industrial capacity in Germany to try to save energy. Uh, they burnt as much coal uh, as they possibly could get their hands on, which was a, a full abandonment of 20 years of energy and climate policy. And they were able to stockpile a lot of gas by doing those things. And then, of course, what happened was that winter really never came in Europe. It was the warmest winter on record in the last 45 years, and here in the U.S. as well. Uh, we also had a major fire at a big export terminal here. And so some gas backed up in this country since it was unable to be exported. So in a year, you, you brought inventories in what would have was expected to be a really, really tough spot last winter. You actually ended the winter with inventories above average in both Europe and the United States. And that just took the air out of the gas market. And so we saw prices here in the U.S. fall from seven, eight, ten 10 bucks all the way down to two dollars at their lows back in March, and now today they're still trading at three bucks. And in Europe, gas is about fifteen, and in Asia, it's about the same. So the U.S. still has this 
enjoys this natural gas price that is, you know, 70 plus percent below the world price. And that's always something that we felt has been long term unsustainable. You know, how on earth can you have such a deep disconnect for U.S. gas prices compared to the rest of the world? And the answer, of course, is that if you produce gas in the U.S., you can't get that world price. You can't access the world market because even though the U.S. has gone from being the world's largest LNG importer to the world's largest LNG exporter, we still produce more gas than we can export. And because of that, we have a disconnect. And what our contention has always been is that if you were to bring on more LNG export capacity, then you had gas to feed it, that disconnect would close. And it could close really, really quickly. And I think that would be really shocking for U.S. consumers and, and U.S. investors as well. And so do we see that happening now? Well, by the end of next year, the middle part of 25, you're going to bring on 6 BCF a day of new LNG export capacity. You have 12 BCF a day running now, so that'll be a 50% increase on that. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, well, how much gas can you bring online? You know, Does anyone have any idea how much gas we have brought online in the last 12, 18 months or so? It's been basically zero. You know, the Marcellus has stopped growing, and people think it's pipeline constraints, but we don't believe that. We think it's geological depletion. The Haynesville, Haynesville is seeing rig counts that are falling because it's an expensive source of gas. And the Permian is suffering massive depletion problems, and we now have four registered months of month-on-month -month production declines in the Permian Basin, something we've never had outside of COVID or the Saudi you know, Thanksgiving massacre of 2014 when they collapsed oil prices. So so we don't have a particularly robust growth supply that we expect to see in the next two years. And to get six Bs in the next two years, I mean, that would be like the equivalent of going back to the the frothiest years of shale growth that we've had. And I think that it's just not in the cards. So here we have six Bs coming online. I don't know where we're going to get it from. And if you open up even a little bit of export capacity, excess export capacity, you could potentially see a market that pins itself on global prices, less transportation, and you go from three to, you know, three to 10. Uh, I don't think anyone's prepared for that. And that's frankly, probably the only market I see that has that type of a dynamic in it right now. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. So just a, a, an easy question first, or an easier question than a tough one. Obviously, at the moment, the news is full of... of you know, Chevron, Exxon, all acquiring, um, and most of the, you know, the, the transition in, in shale, particularly in Texas, has been from small independence to then the big guys coming in. And, you know, the, the story there is more, you know, efficiency and so forth and, and so on. Obviously, nothing like, you know, high prices solve high prices. Do you think with eight bucks, these companies can access new resources? I mean, how fundamental, I mean, do you think the Permian, for example, is depleting? And can technology and more money solve that and find new areas? Or, or is this, in your view, something that's geologically absolute, so to speak? Well, look, I don't think anything's absolute. And I think if you got a big rally in prices, you know, would you be able to put more to work? And would you be able to potentially get some more production for a period of time? I think the answer is, you know, probably. Um, however, I, I tell people, and this might be a little bit silly, but, you know, imagine an oil field and imagine that you produce it completely unconstrained or gas field. There's no shortage of capital. There's no shortage of services. And then all of a sudden prices fall. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to stop drilling and production's going to fall. And then what happens if you prices rebound? Well, you'll start drilling and production will come back. So obviously production at a basin is really dependent on price. Now imagine another basin where prices you know, in magical country, prices are always fixed at exactly the same amount. They, everyone can generate a nice return. Well, the companies are going to go and they're going to drill and production is going to ramp up. And then, you know, if they drill all the good areas available, production is going to start to fall and they'll drill the second tier and production will keep falling. And then I said to you, okay, well, we'll double the price. What's it going to do to volumes? Well, it's not going to do anything because the field's depleted. So obviously depletion plays a role. 
And I, and I think there's like this weird kind of dichotomy where you know, it's a false decision that people are asked to make where they say, well, won't price save us or won't technology save us? And the answer is that price is really important to determining the production profile of a curve and geology is really important. And as the analyst, you have to ask yourself, what side of the curve are you on? Are you on the side of the pendulum here where price matters more or where geology matters more? So consider, for instance, like the Haynesville back in 2010, you know, the Haynesville declined by about 40%. And that was driven by price. And how do we know it was driven by price? Well, production then rebounded and made a much bigger high today than we were at the old peak, you know, a decade ago. So obviously, it was mostly economic and price related. It wasn't geological related at all. And the other reason we know that is that when production rolled over back then, you had only produced about 25, 26% of the total recoverable gas in that field. And so that would be a very unusual time for a field or a basin to roll over. Now you're at 50%, though, or 48%, 49%. That's much, much, much more traditionally associated with the type of depletion at which point the field then rolls over. And so now the question is, you know, as you start to get some mild declines here and as rigs are put down and stop drilling in the Haynesville, if you got a spike in price and you put drills back to work, would you see the same type of recovery that you saw a decade ago? And I think the answer to that is no. So, you know, I don't want to dismiss what technology can do and I don't want to dismiss what, what price can do. But when you stop drilling your best tier one areas and you start moving rigs into tier two that have half the productivity you're never going to be able to get that same strong production growth that you had earlier in the field when you had lots of really good wells left to drill. The second question would be, what's the political risk here? So if, if actually we saw that substantial rise up in natural gas prices in the US, do you think that whatever administration is going to be in power at that point, and I, I reckon they'd have different approaches to some extent, would they be willing to turn off the liquefaction plants in an effort to support domestic economy? I do think that's a real risk. Uh, and, and obviously, you know, you have to see uh, what the environment's like at the time. But yeah, I, I would suspect that if you had a tripling or a quadrupling of U.S. gas price, particularly if it happened suddenly, particularly if it happened in an, in an election year, uh, I could easily see the U.S. Uh, banning or limiting uh, exports of gas to try to favor the domestic market. I mean, first of all, we've seen lots of countries do that over the years in different parts of the world. Notably, you know, when their domestic demand tends to grow at the same time as their fields kind of plateau, uh, we've seen countries, uh, Egypt, Indonesia, many, many countries favor their domestic markets. Uh, and we've seen the U.S. do it. You know, after the oil embargoes in the 1970s, there was a ban on exporting crude oil from the U.S. That was eventually repealed in 2015. Um, so, you know, I think that that you definitely will. Uh, what does that do for gas prices here and gas equities? I mean, I think that there's a big, big rally between now and then. Uh, but I think that is something that you have to watch out for and something that you have to monitor very closely. Let's move on to to nuclear, because obviously we, we ended the last episode and you you highlighted that the Iroy on nuclear was 100 to 1. And there were already some really exciting developments around using um, you know liquid salt rather than water, which, which removes some of the engineering headaches and so forth. And I think what's happened this year as well, and let's start perhaps here, there's been a bit of a, a zeitgeist shift in terms of a willingness to accept that nuclear is fundamentally key to to energy transition i'd love to kind of get your your update on just from a i guess a, a broader public shift in view have you are you starting to see that needle turn i think we are i do think that people that we talk to are, are keen to talk about nuclear power and they're keen to talk about uranium markets and so i do think that there's a certain amount of understanding and acceptance that nuclear power will solve both our carbon issues as well as our efficiency issues in a way that that would be lacking for you know renewables so i think that that's really positive i, I think that's happening if you talk to people in the nuclear industry and to some degree i think this myself too you know people have been hurt so badly over the years with changes in sentiment and stuff like that that i think everyone's really skeptical you still you know that that the public's mind has really changed for good um and so i think i feel a little bit that way too you know we'll have to wait and see there's a few 
you know, developments that the NRC has to get through in the next couple of years in terms of approving new reactor designs. Uh, we, we have to see, you know, actual commissioning decisions and stuff like that. Uh, and, th and then I'll be really convinced that people are sincere. But, you know, it, for the time being, yeah, it seems like it seems like sentiment has become a lot more favorable, which I'm you know, thrilled to see because really nuclear power is the, the answer to everything that we need. It, it's been described, I think, quite appropriately as the most successful failure of all time. Successful, of course, because it's delivered on all of its goals and all of its promises, and a failure because we've just basically because of a you know, 30, 40, 50 year period of relatively cheap and abundant energy, uh, we've just relegated it to the dustbin. We haven't really needed it. But I think that time's changing now very quickly. Yeah. And the economics of it as well, right? I mean, let's talk China for a moment and talk uranium prices, because obviously the Chinese have been building nuclear power plants at a, a really great clip and are now kind of the world's leaders in that by a, by a long margin. You know, can you talk about their embrace of it? And, and let's, let's lean into uranium prices, because that we're seeing it expressed explicitly there as well. And there aren't too many uranium traders in the world, but, you know, they're having they've had a good couple of years. Yeah, so you know, t talking from a cost perspective first, you know, the, the the other side of the renewable conundrum is probably the nuclear question, which is to say, if its eroy is so good, why are its costs really high? And there's some interesting answers for that, and part of it, I think, is some mistakes in the modeling, and part of it is the fact that you know we've basically completely dismantled the nuclear engineering business, particularly in the West, and so. Even a third generation reactor is basically a, a one of a kind type of a design now. And so you're starting to see these unbelievable diseconomies of scale, uh, which hopefully, uh, and you're just seeing a lack of skills that are needed, including like welding of all things. You know, the high specification welders are just not available. Uh, and so what we end up with are these substandard welded joints in the third generation nuclear power facilities that have to go and be be redone. Uh, and that just drives the cost higher and higher and higher. So I, I think to some extent, those costs are going to you know, normalize as we get our institutional knowledge back on how to build these things. But the other thing that, that's really, really even simpler than that is, is just in the calculation of levelized cost of electricity, everyone's using the wrong useful life for a nuclear reactor. You know, everyone's using like 30 years where all of these reactors are now being extended and their life is being pushed, you know, in 50, 60 years. And I presume that some of them will still be working after 80 years. So if you start to put that through and all of your capital is up front relative to your OPEX, which is very true of, of nuclear power plants, then, you know, the, the levelized cost of electricity plummets and it starts to look a lot more in line with what its EROI says that it should. You know, China is building reactors. They have a very, very robust new reactor program. They're basically the only country in the world with, with as uh, robust a, a new build program. And um, they're bringing these things on, you know, on time, on budget. Uh, they're doing it with basically stolen AP1000 Westinghouse reactor designs. That's the same facility that was brought online, uh, the Vogel facility in South Carolina that saw its costs here in the U.S., you know, double, triple and be 10 years delayed. So so you can do it. It's not hard. You just you need to have a little bit of know-how and, and you need to, you know, get a couple under your belt to, to get better at it. Now, as far as uranium prices, uranium peaked out at $150 a pound last cycle back in, you know, 2007 and fell all the way to 18 bucks by 2018. So that's a pretty dramatic, you know, that's a 90 90 ish percent peak to trough fall in the uranium price. And today we're we're sitting, you know, in the low 70s. So it's been a really nice rebound. You know, it it feels like it happened overnight, but but if you were actually in the market like we were, uh, investing in uranium companies. It's taken a few years, that's for sure. We got involved right at the bottom. Uh, and what's really what was interesting about that market is that with uranium at 18 bucks, you only had two primary producing uranium companies in the whole world. You had Cameco in, in Canada and you had Kazataprom in Kazakhstan. And they could still make a margin, but only because they had locked in longer prices on their contract book. If you looked at their cash cost of production and you looked at the spot price at the lows, you had a duopoly and both of the companies were underwater on a cash margin. I've never seen that in a commodity market. You know, maybe when oil went negative for the day, that was true for everybody. But, you know, normally people look at a cost curve and they say, when you get into the the, the top 10% of that cost curve, 
and the, and the spot price falls below that, that's when you'll start to form a bottom. Here you blew through the bottom, you know, the cheapest 10% of the cost curve and you still couldn't make a margin. And the projects to bring on, you know, that's a cash cost basis to say nothing of the incentive price needed to bring on a new uranium mine. That was always between 75 and 100 bucks. And so, you know, I, again, I never recall, Lear, I never recall seeing a commodity spot price so far below the incentive price to bring on new supply. And there are lots of reasons for that. You know, we shut 30% of our nuclear reactor base following Fukushima. So, I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why that happened. But when people say, well, has it gone too far now? You're only now starting to get back to that incentive price that could, after a number of years, look to bring on new mine supply. And so, you know, when we, when we think through kind of how the bull market in uranium will eventually end, I suspect it's going to be more new sub mine supply coming online as opposed to high prices curtailing demand. Because if you look at the total cost of uranium fuel in a nuclear reactor, it's, it's quite low. They can withstand pretty high prices. But, you know, if, if you leave prices high enough for long enough, you'll start to develop new mine supply. Now, that's not going to be a this year story or a next year story. It's really not going to take place till the end of the decade, at which point maybe we have enough SMR demand to meet that. But, you know, I, I would watch the CapEx cycle. I would watch the new mines that are being sanctioned uh, around the world and, and follow their progress uh, very closely. But until then, it's going to be a really strong bull market. Yeah, interesting. And let's let's move on to technology and perhaps start with small modular reactors. <laughs> you know, and and as, as you highlighted at the start of this episode, like the the current suite of companies investing in this just keep needing more money, right? I mean, where is the technology at? Where is that story at? Or, or do you think it's going to be these next generation nuclear at scale, which are just going to be using fundamentally different cooling technologies and so forth? Well, so it's an interesting question, and, and there's you know probably 40 different SMR companies developing 40 different SMR technologies. And, and one thing that, that I, I find kind of humorous is, is each one will tell you why the other 39 are terrible and will never work. Uh, and I, I feel like, say, guys, you know, you should probably all just talk about the benefits of nuclear in general, you know, we'll, we'll instead of focus on all this. Mm, yeah. But, you know, there, there's differences in... In cooling mediums, there's differences in, in fuel, uh, and, and everything has pros and cons. But basically, the way it kind of divides down, I in my mind anyway, and this is probably a gross oversimplification, you, you almost have kind of like three different categories. One category is just taking a third generation reactor, so basically like the AP1000, the big Westinghouse 1.1 gigawatt facility, and, and shrinking it down to something that's a third to a quarter the size. The idea there being that you could manufacture them in a facility instead of manufacturing them on site. So you could get scale, you'd have a standard design. And ideally, with if you have a 350 megawatt facility, you could probably go and start to shut down a lot of coal-fired plants and use the grid interconnects and stuff like that that are already there. So so I get that, you know, the benefit to that type of a of a design is that you're not reinventing the wheel. And you're adding some of the you know latest and greatest engineering, uh, like passive uh, safety features and things like that. And you probably will get some economies of scale by building it all in a fab facility. Uh, the downside, of course, is that it's not going to be fundamentally or structurally different than a third generation reactor because it's not. You know, there's nothing that they're doing that's really different. So I would suspect for that, you know, your Eroy is probably going to be comparable, maybe a little, maybe a little worse, just because. In, in energy systems, typically scale gives you a little bit of savings. So if you make something bigger, you know, you can amortize certain things. But, you know, probably around that 100 to 1, the levelized cost, it'll come down a little bit because you probably do get some manufacturing benefits. But I would think it would be in the same ballpark as, as what third generation nuclear designs could achieve. So So I almost don't even think of them. Yes, they're small, but, you know, they're just, they would be the latest and greatest update to the to the third gen reactors. Then you have, you know, a company called TerraPower, which is based out in Washington, backed by Bill Gates. They have a joint venture uh, with Pacific Corp and the US Department of Energy. And what they're doing is they're, instead of using water to cool the reactor core, they're using molten salt. And the benefit of doing that is that the boiling point is much, much, much higher. And so the salt which, you know, turns from a solid into a, into a liquid that looks very similar to water, 150 degrees and doesn't boil until five or 600 degrees, maybe even a little higher than that, that can take all of the uh, heat off of the reactor core without boiling and without 
introducing a lot of pressure. So in a normal reactor, water, of course, boils at 100 degrees C. The reactor generates heat at, at higher than that. And so unless you keep that water under pressure and pump new water, new cold water on top of the reactor all the time, you run the risk that that reactor overheats. And so that's why your steel and your cement, you know, first it's the steel that has to be super, super thick to withstand these high pressures. And then the massive cement uh, foundations to be able to support all that steel, that all goes away with the Terra Power and their molten salt, which it's not just them, but they're the farthest along uh, with a molten salt reactor design. These are designs that have been tested and, and done in a lab setting and in a large lab setting, you know, national labs and stuff like that for 50 and 60 years. So we have hours and hours, thousands of hours of um, data on the safety of these types of systems. Uh, and those, I think, really are a fundamental difference. You know, there you're talking about now all of a sudden needing, in some cases, you know, an order of magnitude less material to generate the same amount of electricity. And because of that, your your eroid just skyrockets. And in theory, your levelized cost of electricity should really come down quite nicely. Uh, then the third would be a whole kind of grab bag of a really advanced, the, not theoretical is maybe too strong of a word, but but really advanced design. So there's some you know high gas, high temperature gas projects in there, uh, and and there's you know you just kind of go down from there. And 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 I think unfortunately the problem with with some of those is that um, it is a lot that you're asking the regulatory commissions to start to understand. You know, the the the, the downside, it's kind of like Goldilocks a little bit, you know, the, the new scales of the world, which are just making small third generation reactors, there's not enough change. A lot of these other designs, there's a little bit too much change. Uh, and then I think there's a few of them that kind of thread the needle quite nicely. We're not invested in any of them. So that's just, that's just my view look, looking from the outside. And most of these organizations, these companies are private at the moment, right? I mean, they're, they're quite hard to invest in, in some of them. That's right. Like I said, New Scale listed via a SPAC a couple years ago, and it's done about as well as all the other SPACs, which is to say not very well. Although it held in for a while much better, but now now it's 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 down substantially. Uh, Terra Power remains private, and uh, most as do most of the others. Yeah, and Terra Power is the one that is is using that new technology. Kind of, I would argue, threads the needle, and, and Bill Gates is involved, right? He is. Yep, he is. And 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 Pacific Corp, which is owned by Berkshire Hathaway, is the utility that has the joint venture with them. I guess looking towards next year, and again, I'll encourage listeners, and I'll put links in the in the show notes to your to your investment analysis, which is is free and accessible and well worth a read, as I hope listeners will feel after this conversation as well. You know, as you look towards next year, you know, have have we already laid out the major themes, which is essentially gas to the upside renewables are going to struggle with these headwinds of interest rates playing into material costs and so forth alongside already established challenges around permitting and so on globally and and you know what what else do you see for next year is it going to be sort of we, we've just done a, a piece in our q3 market review sort of saying back to normal question mark you know volatility is down in commodities but it does feel like there's lots of opportunities and flashpoints where we could see significant volatility and, and prices shoot back up yeah i think that the risk here is, is that a year ago we saw a major pinch point developing in the winter of 22 23 and for a variety of reasons sometimes different in different markets notably the lack of a winter for the gas market and then these huge spr releases or strategic petroleum reserve releases from the u.s and other governments through the winter as well pushed that off but they didn't really get at any of the underlying issues. I mean, certainly having a warm winter doesn't fix the gas market. And certainly, you know, releasing your stockpile of uh, strategic crude doesn't address the issues in the crude market. And so here, you know, we've, we've spent this year, uh, it's been frustrating, you know, it's, it's been volatile, prices ran, they fell, and they rallied back. But I think we're basically kind of where we were at the same time last year, you know, with the exception of gas, gas has a little bit more of a buffer. And so I think the risk of a, a near term, you know, pinch point is, is maybe a little bit diminished. But, you know, if you fast forward a year from now, with all that new LNG export capacity coming on, particularly if you have a normal winter or cold winter, and things are gonna be really, really tight. So I think a lot of ways like last winter has been pushed out. Uh, and, and we went made it through this year of sort of one off abnormal things, the SPR and, and really warm winter. And here we are uh, a year later, 
and all the same trends are in place, if not gotten a little bit worse. Because over the last year, you know, the Permian's now, like I said, registered four consecutive months of declines, and the Marcellus is basically bumping along flat for a whole other year. So we've just gone farther in time, and uh, and I think that that is the major risk here as we look forward into 2024. Yeah. And, you know, given the results today, we're recording uh, late October, it doesn't seem like the Fed's going to reduce interest rates uh, anytime soon either. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. That it definitely puts the Fed in a tougher position. You know, I think the Fed uh, was enjoying the fact that, that energy and material prices were falling and that was helping, you know, a lot of the headline numbers. And now I think if that were to move back the other way, that just makes their decision making that much more difficult. Yeah. Well, Adam, uh, it's been really enjoyable having you back on. Again, I'd encourage listeners to go listen to episode 140 and, and 148 for the background, at least the early part of this discussion. And, you know, hope to have you back on again in, 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 this time next year. And we'll see where we are. Very good. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this too. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.